The surface of the Earth is constantly in motion. Soil formation is driven from below, when rocks are lifted upwards by forces inside the Earth, and then, when close to the surface, are broken down into soil by weathering. On the other hand, soil is removed from Earth's surface from above by erosion. Erosion occurs through flowing water, through wind or through glaciers. But a third factor is the diversity of life in the form of plants, animals and microorganisms. A green skin on Earth's surface. All these factors interact at Earth's surface. We can imagine this as a dance. The rock world in grey and the living world in green interact. Both dance harmoniously in a stable balance. A disturbance brings the two out of beautiful harmony. This could be a landslide, climate change or the appearance of a different plant species. Only slowly does the green life bring the grey rocky world and its landscape back into their original balance, a feedback of the natural earth system. We already know a lot about processes acting at the Earth's surface, but most studies fall within the traditional boundaries of individual scientific disciplines. Soil science deals with soil formation and the plant roots that grow in it. Geochemistry is concerned with chemical conversions at the Earth's surface. Microbiology investigates the microbial communities at Earth's surface. Plant ecology investigates the relationships between climate and plant diversity. Geomorphology investigates how landscapes form and erode. But what we see at the Earth's surface also depends on how long we look. If you let a plant grow, visible changes can be seen after only a few days. Biological research tends to think about the timescales plants grow over. On the other hand, landforms like mountains and valleys always seem to look the same. Geological research, therefore, thinks in much longer periods of time than biological research. These different timescales are a major hurdle for interdisciplinary research. The large German-led research project Earthshape wants to overcome this obstacle. The international project performs field experiments in the Chilean coastal mountains. In Earthshape, German and Chilean universities and research institutes collaborate. The scientists investigate how the activity of living organisms affects the Earth's surface and how, conversely, the composition of the subsoil influences the life sitting on it. In Chile, four locations with very different climates are compared with each other. The most obvious impact of climate can be seen in the vegetation density. The northernmost location, the Pandazucar National Park, is located in the driest desert on Earth, the Atacama Desert. Virtually no plants grow there. The Santa Gracia Reserve is a semi-arid area with only a few cacti and shrubs, but no trees. The more southern La Campana National Park has a Mediterranean climate with palm trees and considerable rainfall and dense vegetation. The southernmost location, Nahuel Buta National Park, is a rainforest with a lot of rainfall. Araucaria, an impressive tree that dates back to the Jurassic period, can be found here. Thirty doctoral students from all disciplines are working in Chile to establish new knowledge. Some of the questions are, where do plants take up nutrients from weathered rock? The samples taken in Chile are measured for their isotope composition using an isotope mass spectrometer. 
The isotope ratios are then evaluated as fingerprints of the origin of nutrients. Another question is how exactly do nutrients get from the soil into the plants? In the laboratory, root samples from Chile are investigated under the microscope. The uptake is simulated to follow the path of carbon in the plant and in the soil. The different forms of carbon of the soil are identified on a gas chromatograph. How exactly does the uptake of nutrients in soils differ between an area in humid climate from the uptake of nutrients in dry climate? On the left, we see a soil column in a humid area. There are not enough nutrients in the soil. The fast-growing ecosystem is nourished mainly from recycling. The trees obtain their mineral nutrients from the leaves that fell in autumn, which are decomposed into soil organic carbon. In the dry area on the right, with only sparse and slow-growing vegetation, the nutrients are mainly taken up from the rock and are hardly recycled. Another question. How does the climate and vegetation in the different regions affect how landscapes look like and how fast they erode? Quartz crystals, extracted from the sand in a riverbed in Chile, are decomposed in an ultra-clean laboratory using hydrofluoric acid to measure the so-called cosmogenic nuclides. The erosion rate of a river catchment can be revealed. With the erosion rates, the influence of vegetation on landscape development can be explained. How does climate affect plant diversity and the decomposition of their leaves? The leaf litter samples are being weighed to determine how quickly the leaves decompose over time. Statistical methods are employed to determine the influence of climate on plant cycles. So how do we combine all the findings of the landscapes with the data of their vegetation? One possibility is by using computer simulations. In this computer model, a landscape develops under high rainfall, such that dense vegetation would influence the shape of the landscape. Plants influence how the rivers erode into the landscape and how sediment makes it to the rivers. They intercept rainfall, which limits the water's ability to erode Earth's surface. And because of their protective effect on the mountain slopes, the plants concentrate water runoff and erosion into large, deep valleys. If we zoom into one catchment, we see that vegetation obstructs the flow of water and focuses it into channels. This landscape is very similar to what we see in Parque Nacional Nahuel Buta, in south-central Chile. The Earth's system stabilizes itself by the interactions between the tectonic forces of the deep Earth, climate-driven erosion, and through the diversity of life on the Earth's surface, the so-called feedbacks. One such feedback is rock weathering, in which biology plays a role. By using carbonic acid, rock weathering constantly consumes CO2 from the atmosphere, albeit very slowly. Thus, rock weathering balances the release of new CO2 from volcanoes. Since CO2 warms the Earth's atmosphere, this feedback has stabilized Earth's climate for many millions of years. Another feedback comes from the plants of the Earth that stabilize the CO2 of the atmosphere and thus the Earth's climate much faster. If the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere increases, more plants grow through faster photosynthesis. The CO2 in the atmosphere falls again. But today, humans are adding large amounts of additional CO2 to the atmosphere. It throws the system out of balance, and neither the vegetation nor the rock weathering of the Earth can retain balance again quickly enough.
the result is global warming, with major consequences for the planet's surface and humankind. With their research on the coupled processes within this fragile zone, where life meets rock, the members of the Earthshape project aim at evaluating the sensitivity of this system to perturbations. In doing so, they allow mankind to assess the impact of the climate change induced today, and what should be done to preferably prevent this major perturbation, which will affect our livelihood in ways that are hard to imagine.